Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to our listeners of the podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. I am really excited about today's podcast. It's one of those rare times when we get to have an interview, not just with an amazing subject, but with multiple members of the family, specifically to the topic that we're talking about today, which is how your family can thrive through generations despite setbacks and crisis. Uh, I'll get to introducing the family in a second, but I want to give a little bit of context to what we're doing. I'm often asked with the thousands of families that I know and so many that I've spoken with directly through my podcasting, my videos, what makes a family successful through the generations? It takes an amazing wealth creator and entrepreneurial spirit to sort of speak, create the wealth. But the most valuable aspect to a family sustaining their wealth is the challenges around family dynamics. It's not investing at that point. It's not even taxes and estate planning. That's all a part of it. And they're encompassing into the importance of having the proper game plan and putting it together. But the issues around family dynamics, not a unified sense of purpose. What is the family's vision? How does that correlate to their values and their mission? Those are all the things it's indirectly or incorrectly called the soft stuff. It's the hard stuff. That's the thing that makes a family sustain and a reminder, sustain not just in their wealth, their financial wealth, that's a part of it, but their wealth and riches go far beyond a simply financial wealth. How about their spiritual? How about their intellectual? Their societal? There's multiple forms of capital and value that a family wants to pass on by defining their sense of purpose, by having values, and by having that coordinate into a mission and vision statement, which admittingly need to be updated frequently, although some of the core principles relative to family success over generations and their long-term vision do effectively remain the same. We're very fortunate today to feature Lonnie and Shelly Ginger, husband and wife, and Lonnie's been a very frequent guest uh, speaking at Family Office Association events, as well as in our podcasting, and he's amazing. And really to make it intriguing, their daughter's joining us today, Shalann Watt. So we're very fortunate, Lonnie, Shelly, and Shalann, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Angelo. I sure appreciate all that you and the Family Office Association are doing to create venues like this to be able to share insights and have discussions that may help other families, especially during this unique time in history. So I appreciate how you've, you've pivoted to make opportunities like this available. And I don't think that there's ever been a time in history where more families have faced such significant longer term challenges, challenges to both the tangible wealth that we've hoped to pass on to future generations and, and even challenges to some of the intangible wealth, as you alluded to, that we've hoped to pass on to future generations. So look forward to having this discussion, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot, and we'll learn a lot from uh, other people who are watching this too. Yeah, that's going to be fantastic. And for those that may be viewing or listening in as it's being recorded, uh, we're going to do this one a little differently. Given that I do these every day, and probably it gets a little tiring, even to me, have it be in simply a Q&A format with me all the time. Every now and then we like to mix that up a little bit. So having the unique dynamic of the family interacting and asking each other questions, I think is going to be an excellent change of pace. And we very, very much look forward to that. On that note, I'm kind of Lonnie, kind of give the floor to you to kind of do what you need to do and interact with the family. I look forward to being an observant and having it be an amazing production for my members. All right, thanks, Angelo. So 
Shelly and Shalane and I are excited to share some of the perspectives and experiences that we've developed on this in our family. And I'll be the first to say that we, we definitely don't have all the answers. <laughs> like you, we're just doing our best to learn as we go. And we found that as we share what we're learning, we often end up learning way more from what we hear back from others like you. That's right. So please reach out to us with your questions and your thoughts on what we talk about today. So just like you, my family and I are dealing with challenges we never expected in our lifetime. We're having conversations about things we never thought we'd be talking about. Um, there's, there's no data to predict what's happening now and how it implies uh, impacts on the future. There's no data to rely on for how to deal with this. And what happens is in the absence of experience or data, it can cause a lot of uncertainty or even fear. And that can lead to actions or decisions that can have downside effect for our long-term success as families or in our businesses too. And if not success, maybe it has downside effect on our synergy and our relationships and our family. So when everything around us is changing, when so much seems uncertain, it's super helpful to focus on what will remain constant. What are the constants in our lives right now? What are the constants in our businesses right now? And what are the constraints in our families during these times? And what are the constants in our family during these challenging times? So for our family, a constant, a constant guiding force is what we call our family compass. And I'd say now more than any time before, this is an opportunity that we're trying to embrace to focus on developing and sustaining a, a multi-generational viewpoint on our family compass to keep our individual families headed in the same direction together, ideally over multiple generations, regardless of the challenges, and maybe even stronger together because of the challenges. That would be the ideal hope. So uh, Shelly and Shalan and I were, were talking about this, um, this whole topic in preparation for this meeting, of course. And uh, when we were talking, it reminded us of an experience our family had at one of our family backpacking trips uh, just a few years ago. Um, we were hiking high up in the Silver Cloud Mountains of Idaho. And it was the end of one of those days where it was cold and miserable windy, rainy, all day on the trail. Uh, one of those days that were just miserable enough to make for permanent memories that we talk about <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so I always remind the kids of that, that this is just miserable enough. We're, we're gonna remember this and talk about this for years <laughs> to come, right? So, and it was, it was uh, almost dark and the wind was blowing the cold rain up under our ponchos and down our necks and our rainproof gear was giving out. The only proof it gave was that it wasn't able to withstand these conditions. Um, but the place we had planned to camp for the night was this little lake we found on the map. Perfect lake for our family because it was a lake that had no trails to it. We liked those kinds of little places where nobody else goes to. And it was called Castle Lake. Now, it was called Castle Lake out in the middle of nowhere, but what's, what's not to like about a castle? when you haven't seen plumbing or electricity for a week. So we were all excited about getting to Castle Lake and we finally got to the spot on the trail where we needed to leave the trail and start bushwhacking our way up over the ridge to the lake. And so we went, you know, up the ridge down the other side and we found no lake anywhere. <laughs> and we figured, well, we must have left the trail too soon. So we fought our way back to the trail, hiked to the next ridge and bushwhacked up the ridge and down the ridge to find the next basin where the lake was supposed to be. And there was no lake, just more rain. By then it was, it was literally getting dark and the storm was getting more fierce. We couldn't even find our way back to the trail. We couldn't find the trail again. It was like, ah, we, we are all cold and miserable and frustrated. And uh, our, our two sons thought we should go one way and uh, our two daughters were absolutely sure the lake was the other way. And uh, Shelly, I think you just wanted to set up camp wherever we were so, before we froze to death. Sounds like me. Or 
before we bit each other's heads off. <laughs> but all of us wanted to go a different direction. And I'd clearly lost any leadership in my family. And finally, Shelly said these infamous words. She said, honey, why don't you get the GPS out of your pack? And okay, uh, it was an embarrassing moment. I, it was a new GPS. I, I'd never used it before. I didn't even think we'd need it, but I just threw it in my pack. And I didn't jump on Shelly's suggestion right away because, I, well, I guess I was embarrassed because I didn't really know how to use the GPS. But then one of the girls said, Dad, you have a GPS, you have a compass? Why in the world haven't we been using it? So I, took my pack off, pulled the GPS out of my pack, and we all huddled around that little GPS and found this little blue dot on the map labeled Castle Lake. And we had passed it miles ago. <laughs> so none of us were right about our deeply entrenched beliefs about how to get where we wanted to go. No one had the right data. No one wanted to go back either. We all knew we were wrong, but nobody wanted to go back. <laughs> So we all agreed to pivot and follow the compass to the next closest spot on the map that at least looked level enough to pitch our tents for the night. But what was interesting is that as if by magic, that little compass on the GPS stopped the bickering about which way to go. <laughs> that little compass stopped the blaming for going the wrong direction or the guilt that I didn't do it right. At least I was feeling the guilt. I led the family down the wrong path. That compass gave our family a common frame of reference in the dark and in the storm where we agreed fairly easily at that point on a major pivot in our plans. And to this day, um, the family still gives me a hard time about not using the compass we had with us the whole time. And those words from my daughters periodically ring my ears. Dad, you have a compass? Why in the world aren't you using it? So we're in the middle of a storm right now. There's no trail markers to follow from others who've been down this path before us. That's right. But all of us have a compass. If we have any sense of values or purpose, which all of us do to some degree or another, values and purpose for our life, for our family, for our business, we have a compass. It, it might be tucked away uh, deep in the pack of our mind, so to speak. Uh, we might not be proficient at using it. Our whole family might not be looking at the compass, but why in the world aren't we using our compass more effectively to guide our family, especially during these times, to keep our families together, headed in the same direction, heart, mind, soul plans, visions, whatever, during the storm. So, the guiding compass that each of us have is our core values, our purpose. What do we stand for and why do we do what we do? We may not have those things articulated as well as we could. Uh, the light might be a little dim on your GPS, um, but we can all pull out our compass, dust it off, turn up the light on the GPS, and we can make our values and our purpose more clear, more visible, and use those things as as guidance mechanisms, guidance systems for our families and businesses, especially in the middle of these storm times. So this principle applies to us as individuals and applies to our families and to our businesses. Our mission, our purpose, and our values, those are the constant. They're the basis for collaboration. When we're kind of hiking blind in unknown territory, like in so many ways we are right now, because with, without clarity of purpose in business, um, many of you watching this and listening um, are, are in business and you know this is, this is what happens in business. If you don't have clarity of purpose, our businesses get derailed from optimal success by whatever challenges or even opportunities that come along. But what we don't think about as much is without clarity of purpose in family, Kids can get swept along with the flow of society's values and trends. And without clarity of values and purpose, the next challenge or the next crisis that comes along can, can really easily derail family ideals and worse yet, family relationships. And I would say that the true nature 
of what a family or a business values is clarified in the choices that a family makes or that a business makes under pressure. In fact, the greater the pressure, the greater the opportunity to clarify our values. So for many years in my family, I kept my personal compass hidden in the pack of my brain. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I tried, we both tried to um, live by our values, um, but we didn't know how to, how to take that compass out and articulate those values as guiding statements for our family. And 18 years ago, all that changed for me. I, I met a man who, who challenged us to pull those values out of, out of our heart, out of our head, and intentionally use them as a guidance system, as a compass for, for my family. So here's, here's how that happened. It was actually, uh, Dale, I'll never forget, 18 years ago, I had a conversation. It was actually at a conference. Those conferences we're not doing these days. Um, at a break, uh, a conversation that dramatically changed our family's effectiveness um, at all times, and especially, I think, during times of crisis. So I was presenting at this leadership conference, and during the first break, this affluential gentleman walked up to me and said, Lonnie, I need your advice. I, I've got a thousand employees. We go out and do business, but they're driving me crazy because as soon as I leave for conferences like this, I just know that they aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And I asked him questions like I'd be asking you now if I were having a similar conversation. I said, well, well, for starters, do you at least have a clear written mission, vision, and values and strategies for your company so your people know how to act when you aren't around? And he said, well, I don't, I don't have those things written down, but my, my team knows what we stand for and, and where we're going. I said, well, Greg, if, if you don't have a clear written direction and strategy, your company probably won't create a legacy of success. Then almost a bit indignantly, um, Greg said, well, Mom, let me ask you this. Do you have clear written mission, vision, and values and strategies for your family? And I just, I bit right into it. I, I said, well, Greg, I, I do for my businesses, of course, but I don't have them written down for my family, but it's my family. They know what we stand for and where we're going. Then Greg said, Lonnie, if you don't have a clear written direction and strategy for your family, your family won't create a multi-generational legacy of success. And then he said, what you're telling me, Lonnie, is that deep down, you actually in practice care more about your business success than you care about your family legacy. That was tough. Um, yeah, I remember coming uh, home and telling you about that, yes. Shelly. And, um, you know, of course, I, I try to defend myself like, like a lot of us do. <laughs> but when I really thought about it, there was a lot of truth in that. I, I'd been much more intentional about leading my businesses than I was about leading my family, particularly in this area. So have you ever wondered why is it that some families create a lot of wealth, but not a lot of harmony or shared purpose? Why is it that some families who create wealth and even some harmony when they hit crises, uh, they, they fall apart relationally or synergistically, or uh, they don't work in alignment as effectively? Why is it that some families have wealth and harmony in one generation, but even though the wealth gets passed on, the harmony, the purpose doesn't get passed on to the next generation? So the question is, how do you, how do you go about living life in such a way that you, you're able to leverage the past generation's successes and values while still empowering the next generation to be the architect of their own future? How do you stay on course through multiple generations, even though there's all kinds of challenges or even opportunities that come along that could kind of derail focus? And again, we certainly don't have all the answers, but what what we're sharing with you today is not based on theory. Um, we're just going to share a strategy and uh, case study illustrations from our own family. As I've spent the last 18 years here trying to figure out how to, how to do this effectively, how to pull the compass out of, of our hearts and minds and use, use those things as true guiding forces in our family, just like we do in business. So with that, let me introduce my family a bit here. Um, true, you'd agree. Uh, our greatest treasure is our family. Um, 
was it 36 years ago? Are we at 36 years now or 37? 37. <laughs> See, this is embarrassing, but um, okay. 37 years ago, um, I got to marry this beautiful lady who has been my childhood sweetheart since we were about 13 years old. And uh, very blessed that we got to do life together all these years. And we're the proud parents of four amazing children and our three oldest are married and uh, super excited about the spouses that have come into our home. And Shalan, since you're on, you probably can talk a bit about your journey on that in a bit here. Um, and really proud of our family. Uh, one of our core, of course, everybody is, but and I'm biased, I admit that, but uh, one of our core values that Shelly and I hold dear is building a better world through entrepreneurial ventures. So um, each of our kids and their spouses have their own ventures that they're creating uh, great value in society uh, through, and we really enjoy partnering together on various businesses, uh, things that we've done over years. So with that, I'll give you a little background uh, on myself, um, uh, just to understand help you understand why that conversation with Greg so rocked my world. So I'm the CEO of Wilkinson Corporation and 360 Impact, which is a collection of real estate investment and management companies. And uh, we've done over $2 billion of real estate with a clear direction and strategy that's resulted in some pretty exceptional investment returns and impact results over the last 28 years. Um, I've had thousands of employees and dozens of subsidiaries with an intentional process to at least do our best to, to try and help every one of our employees and our team members all around the country um, grasp and really understand the values and the direction, the strategy of the parent company so that they're able to make effective decisions when their leaders or leaders up the chain are, aren't around. And so I'm, I'm used to doing that in business and over the last 30 some years, I've owned several other businesses and including some leadership training companies for top level executives. So I've been involved in, in coaching uh, internal and external leaders around the world on, on how to develop strategic culture and creation of a great environment that perpetuates the values and strategies of the company over time. But I have a confession. I've always loved my family and I've always loved my businesses. But frankly, I haven't always been nearly as good at intentionally building my family as I have been at building my business. So that's why that conversation with Greg 18 years ago so rocked my world. I mean, isn't it logical? I've, I've done this for my businesses. Why wouldn't I do this for my family that I love so much? So in that conversation, I remember Greg, he literally pointed his finger at my heart and he asked me this question that really rocked my world. He said, why do you invest so much time and energy developing and implementing clear mission, vision, values, and strategies for your business, but you don't take the same intentional approach to leading your family? I honestly never thought about it that way before. I didn't even know where to begin leading my family that strategically. And now for the last 18 years, uh, Greg has become my best friend and, and mentored me a fair bit on how to do this in my family. I've probably mentored him a bit on some things in business. Um, so what, what you're about to hear is based on years of practice and a lot of trial and error in our own family, which has now led to requests to teach this to families around the world, which we never dreamed that would happen. Um, and we don't have a, a business around this, so it's, it's just kind of our, our passion these days. So this will be the highlight version of what we normally like to do in a half day with a family or in a workshop. So buck your seatbelts, we're gonna cover a lot of ground here in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. So um, this slide represents an overview of the two-stage process for creating multi-generational family legacy. Listen, great legacies are no accident. Mere hope is not a likely pathway to a legacy you'll be proud of. A great legacy requires clear strategy and action. So the first stage is defining your family compass that'll provide consistent direction to your family now, through times of crisis, through times of opportunities, and in future generations. So your family compass has these three elements, your family values, your family mission, and your family vision. 
The next stage is planning your strategy for implementation using specific relational strategies and structural strategies. So the key to passing the baton to the next generation, the key to being able to navigate through dark times, challenging times, stormy times is having this strong family compass. When I was uh, about eight years old, I remember my dad gave me a compass. Um, and I still remember being fascinated how the, the needle on that compass always pointed the same direction, no matter where I was. Uh, it's still one of my valued treasures. And what's unique is after all these years, that needle still points north. So the question is, what if you could give your family a compass that will point them in a similar direction as they each carve out their own path in life through thick and thin? So your family compass, again, has these three elements, the family values, the family mission, and the family vision. We're going to have time today to focus at a high level on each of these, uh, but I'll give you... Um, the opportunity to get these PowerPoint slides. And if you want a more step-by-step -step guide, we're happy to send that to you also. So your family compass starts with your family values. These are the non-negotiable principles that guide every action and every decision in your, in your family. Your future generations will be guided by these values that are an overflow of what you stand for as they design their own future. So family values, um, are super effective to guide the way decisions are made, priorities are set, money is spent, people are treated, plans are made and executed. I bet most of you have been involved in companies that have written values, right? Why do companies do this? Because it's been proven time and time again that the more individuals in a business or a family embrace shared values, the more you'll see high levels of loyalty, harmony, and empowerment even if the founder's not around, and even in times of crisis. So 18 years ago, I realized that I had done this for my business, but not for the most important multi-generational organization in my world, my family. So I recommend that you get the right people in your family around a table, in a room together, and answer questions like these to help you discover and document your family values. Questions like, what did you love or hate about your family growing up? What makes you really happy or really sad? Who do you really admire and why? What does it mean for you to be a really good person? After you die, what do you want people to say about who you were? Not what you accomplished, but who you were. And what character traits do you want to see in your children and grandchildren? And that question has become more powerful for us as we we just had our third grandchild, three precious little girls, and I'm thinking more about that these days. Had an interesting conversation with our son-in-law just uh, a couple days ago about how fascinating it is that um, we see in our kids uh, values and actions that we actually never really realized we had <laughs> when we see them lived out in them. And so it's, it's highlighted even more for me with, with grandkids. So... Here's a quick process for identifying your family values. First, just sit down and brainstorm your individual personal values. And then get together, if you have a spouse, a significant other, get together with your significant other and compare um, what values are important to each of you. Discuss why this value is important to me and this one's not important to you as much and see where the commonalities are. If there's values that one of you had that the other one doesn't have that you want to add to your family set of values because it you both want it to be important to your future generations. And if you have older children, um, especially teenagers or above, um, ask them to identify their values and um, integrate their thoughts into your family value process. And then finally, prioritize your, your top you know, 5, 10, maybe even up to 20 to start with um, that represent the guiding principles that you most want for your family for future generations. So this slide lists the core values that my wife and I developed about eight, no, 17 years ago, probably, uh, for our family. And over the years, we've, we've posted these values 
where our family can see them. Uh, we've regularly taught uh, each of our kids individually and collectively something about each value. Uh, we refer to them often um, in conversations and as the basis for decisions and actions. So I uh, wonder if it might be interesting if uh, Shelley and or Shalan, if you want to pick a value or two and just give some examples about uh, how any one of these values have been guiding principles in our family and maybe even particularly in, in these times of crisis. So why don't you start? Yeah, I'm looking through which one I want to do here. Um, okay, so I, I could point out multiple examples, but the one that I feel like is really relevant to my life today is creating value and building a better world through entrepreneurial adventures. And um, our whole family is very entrepreneurial and all of us kids have our own businesses and have had uh, plenty over the last few years, pretty much as soon as we were old enough and maybe even a little bit before that with the lemonade stand and stuff. Um, <laughs> but one of the big uh, common denominators in all our businesses because of our family value of creating value and building a better world is, you know, whatever we do needs to follow those principles. Not only are those great business principles in general, you know, the more value you create, uh, the more value you gain, and therefore the more value you can continue to give. It's a great circle of how business works. Um, but a tangible example of this, just very practical, is um, we started a project as a family uh, a little over a year and a half ago that really, really did this. I mean, it was like every business I had started up until that point had gotten closer and closer to actually building a better world because I think there's stepping stones to that and it might not be as direct, but this project was definitely um, doing that. And so that's my tangible example of that and then there's fun little ones as well but i'll i'll leave it at that no i mean that's great shalane and i think you know what might be even additionally helpful is to talk about how so we made that decision to start that business with family we all i think eight of us at the beginning had specific roles and you ended up being the the ceo of that enterprise uh, talk a bit about the the process of once once the COVID crisis hit and uh, our business got completely shut down, so we weren't able to operate at all. Yeah. Um, and changing environment and you know the the process of having to make a, a a major pivot with that business and how our our values guided us in that. Yeah. Um, so COVID as affected and just for background if you're watching this like a year after we've aired it we're like in the depths of COVID-19 and where we live has been hit especially hard where I live um, and we're still really in the early phases of reopening like barely even reopened and I, I view values as vehicles uh, sorry, I view values as the base and the foundation of everything. And whatever business I start or I'm running at the time is just a vehicle to carry out that value. And when you view it that way, it's you have so much more peace because you're not, you know, at the end of the day, truly attached to a business or a business model because you know you can accomplish your value in many other different ways. And unfortunately, uh, the project we started about a year and a half ago got hit extremely hard by COVID. We were uh, in the top three industries that have probably been hit the hardest um, by COVID-19. And that involved a major pivot, which uh, evolved into shutting down this version of our project in this specific business model. And um, a lot of the family was on the board and we all made that decision together. And it was a really, really difficult decision, especially for me to weigh in on because I, I really 
was attached to the business itself and what we were doing. And I mean, we were literally completely hitting all of our benchmarks and on a great trajectory before COVID hit. Um, but having the understanding that, okay, look, it's, it's not about the physical. It's not about what you can just see. It's not about just the business model. It's really about what are we accomplishing through this? And when our project, our business got to the point to where we weren't able to create value and build a better world. And we wouldn't be able to for who knows how long in this uncertain time, you know, the most effective thing we can do is to find another vehicle to pivot into another vehicle, whatever it looks like um, to accomplish that value. So that's kind of the evolution of it's not always exciting. It's not always black and white, you know, oh, this is going to be our vehicle to accomplish this value for years and years and years. It's going to change and shift. But um, what we'll hit on over and over again in this is having a solid core value basis gives you so much more stability when the world is just shaking you left and right and you can really weigh down on no, when everything, you know, before the situation happened, before the world was ending, I decided that I was going to live my life according to this rule book that I created. And this is just an opportunity to, um, to live that out. And when you really do that, there's so much power. Like in my hardest times in life, getting to that point where it's like, man, this really sucks. I don't like, I don't want to get back up again. Um, but you keep your word to yourself or to your family, whatever. I mean, I have my own personal values. Um, and in those moments when you like do it, even when it's the hardest thing you could imagine doing, that's, that's, those are the most beautiful moments in life for me. So hopefully that gives a little bit more background in the full evolution of how values can fit into a very practical circumstance. Yeah, very helpful. Thank you, Shalane. And uh, honey, do you have any thoughts and any examples of values that- Of course come I do. <laughs> sure I have do. lots of thoughts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Lonnie and I wanted to make sure that during this storm in our country and with our business kind of, um, not not doing what we planned for it to do um and uh we we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose each other and so we instituted a practice called heart check in and we do this daily and what we do the the practicalities are that for 10 minutes he shares what his day was like with three feelings included. Which is hard for me. <laughs> and then I share for 10 minutes about what my day was like with three feelings included. And then what, what we were grateful for, one, one item that we were grateful for, and then one item that we're, we appreciate about each other. And we figured, let's let's do something where as a regular basis we can cover as many of our values as possible and so we do this typically while we're going for a, a walk in the evening of a mile or two um, and the values that are covered with this first of all we love um, vibrant physical and mental emotional health and energy and so that's, uh, we're getting our deep breathing in while we're walking. And then another value that it covers, uh, we want to always have positive, authentic friendships, and especially with each other. And then uh, we want to be able to uh, seek first to understand before being understood. And this helped me in a, in a very great way as I would hear over here, Lonnie, with some really tough conversations during the day. And I would be worried about what he was going through. And it would seem more of an issue to me than it really was to him. And so through him sharing his feelings with me, I could realize, oh my gosh, he's really handling this well. I don't need to worry. 
And one of my um, sons said to me, mom, if you're worried, then dad has to worry about you. So this little check-in with us is, is pivotal to keep my brain quiet and let me inter, um, encourage him that he's doing a great job and he's leading our family well. And it's a daily thing. And that means the world to me. Mm, that's a great example. That's a great <laughs> example of how values um, guide strategy or Shalan, your example of values guide what vehicles we pursue, but strategies change and the vehicles or the businesses, the business models change. And during crisis, what we've tried to keep constant is like, for instance, Shelly um, had some new experiences with me having more business conversations around her than I had before. That's right. Yeah. I, of working from the home office more. Um, and so we thought of one new strategy that we could implement that helped us, particularly during these times, we have more time for walks. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm home more. We have more time for longer walks in the evening. So how do we, how do we capitalize that where we you know, live out? And as you point out, it's actually three values yeah. that, that helps us live out with this intentional check-in process. Yeah, we like to be very efficient and effective <laughs> with our time. And this, is, this really feeds into that. So most people start with strategy. Um, which I, I'm that's my tendency right that's my natural tendency start with you know what strategy should we pursue to accomplish the, the outcome we're looking for here what we're learning more and more these days and I think has been re even reinforced more by these times of challenge that we're in is that it's much more important to start with values um, kind of the, the state of who we are and what we want to be about and then let the strategies morph and change as an outflow of, of that inner state. So um, hopefully that was, that was helpful for uh, just some examples of uh, some things we're doing recently to use some of these. Um, so this slide represents the uh, uh, next gen set of values because we're now in the second generation of implementing our family compass. Um, and we taught our kids to look for potential spouses who had values that aligned with our Ginger family values. And fortunately, they've chosen super wisely. Yes, they um, have. <laughs> and so I'm not just saying that because you're on here, Shalan. Um, we talk about it all the time, yeah. um, unless we are. <laughs> so now our, our three married children are establishing their own family compass in the, in the second generation that aligns with and builds on the first generation family compass. So, so these on the screen here, you see the values of our oldest daughter and her husband. And even though the words aren't exactly the same, if you look closely, you'll see pretty significant alignment mm -hmm. between the values of my wife and I and our first gen set of values um, and the values our, our married kids are establishing for their families. And what's cool about this is this, this creates a, a river of shared culture that flows through multiple generations. And we're not in any way trying to force our future generations to be clones of us. And we never, never told our kids, you, you have to have the same exact values as ours or use the same words. Um, but because our family values were pretty ingrained in our kids, they attracted and chose spouses with similar values. So when the next gen develops their own family values, you can see that they're really in alignment with and um, built on the prior generation's values. In fact, some are quite similar. I'll, I'll pull out three on the screen here from the first generation so you can see how similar they are to the second. So for example, <clears throat> so a few of our, our first generation family values are continual lifelong learning and adventure, enjoying, as Shelly just said, uh, vibrant physical, mental, and emotional health, and wise stewardship of time, money, and resources. So here's a few very related values from the values of our daughter and her husband. Um, so for Warren and Michelle, they value lifelong learning and mastery, health, a daily journey of social, physical, and mental well-being, and stewardship being generous, just, and shrewd with resources and relationships. So <clears throat> that's some examples of first-gen and second-generation family values. Some of you who are watching or listening to this are thinking, well, I'm not married yet, I don't have a family, you know, do I really need to pay attention to all this stuff? So I'll put up a slide here of, uh, Shalane, your, your personal mission and vision statements, and just uh, ask, why don't you talk a bit about this and why you developed personal mission and vision statement, 
when you did it, what it did for you, and most importantly, how it led to this event <laughs> where uh, last fall you uh, searched the world over and found the man of your dreams and got married to Samuel Watt. And I had to literally go to Scotland, so that's why he's wearing a kilt, and that's why he said search the world, which I did to myself because I'm like, there's literally only one in seven billion for me. I need to find him eventually. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, my personal values, it really came from me being an independent person and obviously from a young age, we had had our family values and we would go on vacations, well, backpack trips is our vacation. Um, and, you know, just have these daily practices, weekly practices that reinforce them. So I saw the value in them from a really early age and decided, well, I want to be my own person. And so um, I think it was around 14 that I just kind of took initiative and, and made my own values, which were, well, some of them were on the screen previous to this. And um, then they really shaped a lot for me. I mean, they shaped what business I started. Um, they shaped the type of book I wrote, the type of podcast I had. So a bunch of professional decisions. And then when it came to uh, dating, that was just really interesting in general. And I'm, I'll summarize it by saying I was able to have a few very efficient relationships because I just knew really fast, oh, this person really doesn't align with um, my core values and my direction that I'm going in life. And when I met Sam, it was just such a a testimony to how true this was because literally on our first coffee date in Scotland, you know, we had been talking just as friends, like no romance at all for seven months. And then I got to meet him in Scotland because I was already over there on a trip and I was sitting having a conversation with him. And I like before this conversation, when I even saw him, I got that gut feeling and I was like super skeptical. I'd always heard about, oh, you'll know, you'll have like a gut feeling. Um, and then we're sitting at coffee and I was thinking, okay, well, man, I'm just going to take some time and affirm that gut feeling if it's accurate or not. Um, and our values just kept aligning over and over and over again. And it got to the point to where we uh, eventually decided to get married. But I think you want me to talk a little bit about our shield too. Um, and yeah, I'll, pull, I'll pull that up. So um, this on the screen now is your next gen values that you, for your family. So yeah, share a bit about uh, why and how you and Sam developed these family values. Yeah, so my brother and his wife, uh, in their relationship, they created a thing called their shield. And I'd always liked this idea. And I always knew once I found someone who I thought it could work out with, I always wanted to see if they were going to be interested in it. And so I would always bring it up to friends or maybe guys I liked. And every guy except for Sam was like, uh, yeah, no. Um, and then Sam was totally down. So we took about three months to build out our shield, which is, oh, he's saying four months, four months to build out our shield. <laughs> um, and what, why we did this and where it really came from was not only are we from two different cultures, um, we just were both, we're actually very opposite personalities and it was super important for us to find a aligned foundation of like, okay, what values do we really both jointly care about? And not only what values, but like, what's our definition of those values? And so it was a really valuable thing to do in a relationship because we did it every date night um which was every week for us and we were long distance for a long time so a lot of times it was just a video call and we would just tackle one at a time and we would say okay what what value do we want and let's bullet point out some specific examples of these values and what we really care about and let's formulate it into a sentence and 
uh, once we created them, we actually went through and we would go through each standard is what we call them, but same thing as a value. And we would run that value through multiple different real life examples that we thought we might face to make sure there was no loopholes in them. So if you can scroll down to standard of building up, I like to use this one as an example and for time's sake, I won't read through the whole thing, but essentially here it's um, the concept of we're each other's number one fan and it really clearly describes what that looks like and when we created this we decided okay for for the time being for this season as we're in a new relationship we're going to read through these every single week and we're going to go through them and we're going to kind of evaluate how we're doing at each of these standards so the first few times were like a lot of conversation you know oh i didn't really feel like we were doing well the standard together next year the standard of building up like what strategies can we put in place to um you know meet this expectation that we both set together so standard of building up an example of this one is there could be a time it like at a friend's house or something where i sarcastically said something or sam sarcastically said something that to the person who said it just literally just is funny and they thought it was you know a good thing to say but to the other person they didn't feel built up by it and so on our date nights that would be a time if we hadn't already to say hey this specific example a couple days ago you know when you said that i didn't really feel built up by you here's why and it just put incredible foundations in place in our relationship and communication we still read through it um about every other week now and you know we're kind of at the point to where when stuff happens we bring it up right away but only because we've gotten in this habit of like look we're in this relationship it takes two like i want him to feel like i am his biggest fan and that he's the most important thing in my life and this shield is what we both created like if we if we do this if we're constantly getting one percent better every day this is an actual pathway to making the other person feel like they are the most prized possession to the other person in the relationship so um anything else you want me to go over in that there's a lot more but that's that's a summary <clears throat> that's awesome michelin maybe just share uh, you, you've been through a lot of changes and challenges and uh the first year of your marriage here how have um these um, values that are part of your shield and part of your family compass. How has how has your family compass um, helped you with all these crazy changes you've had in, in just your first year of marriage? Um, well, I obviously don't know a reality without them, but what I do know is we we have had quite the first year of marriage. Um, from everything from we're going through a whole immigration process to um very intense we're both entrepreneurs so just very intense work schedules like right when we got married i was doing 70 to 80 hours a week sometimes and that was not something we planned on um and then a couple months into it we hit covid 19 which turns into a recession which turns into uh the business i was the ceo of you know basically shutting down and that is a lot of change in less than a year and just a wild roller coaster and so having our weekly date night and reading over this and just evaluating like taking it back to what matters to our relationship um, we've already had to make some very hard decisions that were made a bunch easier by you know saying look if we make this decision which seems really good right now um or even makes logical or financial sense we know it's not going to be the best for our relationship and here's a standard from past selves good job you guys of you know <laughs> why that is and 
So it's, it's not made it um, smooth sailing, but it has made it, uh, we have an anchor when the kite is just flying crazy, which is what the world's felt like. Yeah. And we get to come back to, okay, here's, here's what really matters because it's so easy to lose sight of that when the external is so turbulent. Oh, very good. Thank you, Shalane. Uh, I think I'll mention, since I have this pulled up on the screen now, um, our, our Ginger Family Legacy website. And this is a private internal site, so it's, we don't give the link out to others. But just as an example, um, again, you, if you're part of a business that has values and mission vision, they're typically published somewhere where the stakeholders mm -hmm. can see them on a regular basis. We have ours you know, in our office for our business, big, huge posters on the wall in our conference room, et cetera. So we figured, you know, for our family, we're doing things like that. So this is just one example. So uh, that was, there's a section here for each of our uh, next gen and their families where here's, here's Kyla and Ate, our oldest son and his wife and their family mission. May we as a family unleash our full potential in the world, their core values, their marriage standards, their values, um, pictures of key milestones in their life, our precious grandbaby. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, same thing for Orn Lachelle and for our son Sky. Um, there's there's a, a place on this where we capture, Shell and I capture um, videos where we explain what our non-negotiable principles are and why they're important to us. And where we uh, share key insights that we want our future generations to know about, like on interdependence and getting practical with your values, um, et cetera. And of course, here's all of our our core values. Um, we have a place on here for uh, our family history, uh, which is super helpful. But the reality is when in most families, when a grandparent dies, it's like a library that burns to the ground where you lose all the, the, the precious intellectual property that was stored there, uh, the, the years of wisdom gained. And so this is just one of our ways to capture that. So We've got our family tree here. If you, you know, click on, um, of course, so here's, you know, us and our kids and then our parents, et cetera. And if you uh, click on, you know, on any of these, um, you can pull up pictures and uh, stories of the family um, and key documents and uh, things like that. So it's, it's, it's one way that we're using to help capture and reinforce these things in, in our family. So with that, I'm gonna jump back in and uh, just quickly talk about mission and vision here because that's the, the next element of what's important as you're defining your family compass. All right, so your, your family mission is the, the ultimate objective or purpose of your family, what you want to accomplish in this world. And it answers some key questions like, why does our family exist? What's our real purpose? Should communicate something about your family identity, um, which I'll talk about ours in a bit here, um, defines the primary value that you want your family to add to society. Ideally, it's action-oriented, talks about what you plan to do, it should be short enough where it's easy to remember and ideally timeless and <clears throat> multi-generational in its approach. So here's again some sample questions to help you get at what's important to you that may help you understand what your family purpose or mission might be. Questions like, what does your family deeply care about? Uh, what's wrong with the world that just drives you crazy? Like what makes you weep or angry at the wrongness of it? Or the question, like, imagine being at the end of your life and thinking about all that you and your family have accomplished. At that point, what will matter the most to you? If your family could get a message across to a large group of people, who would those people be and what would that message be? Or if you had all the time and money you need to accomplish absolutely anything, what would you and your family be doing in and for this world? So those questions will help you begin to formulate what your purpose in your family might be about. Now, here's a specific process. There's three parts to an ideal family mission statement, the what, the who, and the results. So ideally, you want to define what you want your family to accomplish. So what are the key action words or phrases that indicate what you want your family to do? And then list the who, list everyone or everything that you really want 
your family to help or to impact. And then the results, the key outcomes that you want for your family, the impact you want your family to have on this world. So again, businesses do this all the time. Microsoft has a mission statement they've had for a fair bit here, which is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, so their what is to empower, their who is every person and every organization on the planet, a big who because they're a big company and that they had that before they were nearly this big. And the result is to achieve more. So this slide represents the uh, mission statement for our first generation, which uh, Shell and I have been pretty excited about for quite some time now. Um, we've had it for, for several years here. And it is to courageously lead generations of people to be devoted friends and sold out followers of Jesus. So our what is to courageously lead. There's a bit of our identity in that. You've probably picked up on that from Shalan. We are leaders. That's what we do. We're courageous leaders. Our who is generations of people. We have a generational view of influence. And the result we're looking for is to become devoted friends and sell out followers of Jesus. So we want our descendants to be devoted friends to each other and have many devoted friends. And we are followers of Jesus. And by the way, this is not about religion for us at all. In fact, we're actually not into religion. Uh, but we do think that Jesus was one of the highest impact leaders in the world and uh, a leader that had multi-generational influence, certainly. And we're sold out to following a leader like that who's had so much positive influence on societies across the world for so many generations. And again, let me just uh, clarify here for those that haven't heard us talk about this in person. Uh, we're not suggesting in any way that what's important to our family needs to be important to your family. You, you need to decide and document what's uniquely important to your family. So um, Shelley, can you think of um, any aspect of our mission that has influenced or guided us maybe particularly during these crisis times? Yes, I can. I, uh, I love our what, and that is to courageously lead. And what, um, one thing that we have done with our family during this time in such uncertainty is that uh, many of our kids live close to us. And so we invested in a hot tub, which has become like communication center. And uh, for those of you that don't have that ability, um, a, a Zoom call would work maybe a Zoom call once a week where you gather the whole family together and you can connect on how are you doing? What are you doing to keep your family strong and to keep leadership strong in your life? And many of our topics center around the books that each person is reading. Our goal is to read at least 30 minutes or more a day on something that builds us up, builds the world up. Um, and people can share that around the circle. Um, another thing is, uh, what are you personally doing in your individual families to keep your marriages tight during this troublesome time? Uh, it's always good, good conversation. But the point is to keep that communication alive mm -hmm. and remind us that during troubled times, troubled times is when our leadership is. Um, developed to a higher level and uh, how are we stepping up to that and how are we encouraging others and courageously leading others to step up during these times as well yeah it's so good we've had some interesting conversations about it. it's it's more common than not to be quite influenced by all the craziness that's happening and you see and are yes. bombarded all the time by others and by the media, et cetera, rather than being courageous leaders, being the ones who set the pace yes. and say, no, this, this, there's a lot of opportunity in Absolutely. these challenges. And you know, how can we influence towards the positive yes. and towards the solutions for all the challenges that people are talking about so often. And, and so. when you see trees in nature, if they've experienced a lot of buffeting and a lot of wind, their timber is way stronger than those who haven't been challenged at all. And so I love that example because I love trees. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Good example. 
All right, so here's an example of, of our next, uh, next gen family mission statement from Kylan and Tay. Uh, their family mission is, their what is to lead, their who is generations of people, their result is to take extreme ownership, achieve their full potential, and live gratefully and love unconditionally. So again, you can see a lot of similarities between the first and the second, but not, not exactly the same. A lot of nuances that are uniquely important to them. Okay, the last component of your family compass is your family vision. This is a compelling picture of what your family will look like when it's accomplish, accomplishing its mission. So a couple key principles of effective vision statements. A vision statement succinctly states the ideal future picture for your family. It should be challenging and inspiring. Ideally, short, memorable statements are, are most effective. Um, a while back, we built a Marriott Hotel, and I happen to know because of that that uh, and all the training they did that Marriott has had their vision statement for many, many years before anybody had hardly heard of Marriott. The Marriott family set the vision that they would be the world's favorite travel company. And um, well, right now, I think any travel company is a favorite. <laughs> if any of us could travel, we'd be excited. But um, arguably, they've, they've done a pretty good job at that. Um, so here's some questions um, to help you develop your family vision statement. So we like to do this, this uh, imagination exercise where you imagine that you show up in the lives of your family 200 years from now. 200 years from now, what would you ideally like to see if you could show up and ask people in the community who, uh, that were, who live around your family, what would you like to hear the community, the society say about your family? Uh, maybe you meet some friends or customers or clients of your family members and ask them what their experiences with your family, what would you want to hear them say? Or maybe you're able to, to visit the homes or a gathering, a family reunion 200 years from now. What would you want to hear your family members talking about? And what would you want to hear them say about what they're doing? And how would you want to see them interact? So questions like this, again, help to form the basis for what the vision might be for your family. And then, of course, you, you capture the best of these imagination thoughts into a phrase that casts a compelling vision for what you want your family to look like when it's accomplishing its mission. Um, so our family vision statement for many years now is to be effective friends of God and, sorry, intimate friends of God and effective kingdom builders. I should know this by now, yes. <laughs> uh, to be intimate friends of God and effective kingdom builders. And again, when we developed this, we never thought we'd be sharing this outside of our family. So uh, whatever those words mean to you, I can almost guarantee you that they don't mean the same thing to us. Um, we have built specific meaning into each word and phrase of this vision statement that's unique to us. Um, each word and phrase has some unique, deep meaning for our family that we've talked to our kids over the years and talked about and, again, used as the basis for decisions. So maybe, Shalan, can you just share an example or, or two of, of one aspect of our vision statement that has guided you? Yeah, so when we were super young, we used to do hand motions, like we were very young, young enough to where reading things was the most boring thing ever. So dad would make and mom would make hand motions to our values and our mission and our vision. And the one for builder was this one. It was like kingdom builders. <laughs> and this motion is actually kept with me a lot um because it it reminds me that whatever i'm doing um even if i fail over and over again i'm building on something and just the the concept and the mindset of am i better today than i was yesterday am i um calling myself to a higher standard than before. So that concept of building has probably been the most relevant one to me, especially lately. It's interesting. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> I think you made up those actions. <laughs> Who would have thought that that would be our mature, beautiful so awesome. adult daughter is, <laughs> is still thinking of the actions he made <laughs> back then. Amazing what sticks with us. It's, and today, it's interesting, and today, even in everyday life, whether it's in conversations or interacting on, on social media or whatever, whenever we see someone in our family doing something that demonstrates some aspect of revision, we, we try to celebrate that decision or action in a way that 
ties it to some aspect of our of our family vision and uh and like being an effective kingdom builder to us means that in our family we do things that build positive enduring values into the world with clear leadership that's what kingdoms that last are all about they have clear leadership they have clear values and principles that guide them um and so when we see each other doing stuff like that we'll, we'll comment about that and it's just fun so all right, so here is an example of, uh, again, our, uh, our, our daughter and son-in-law, Michelle and Oren. Uh, their next-gen family vision is to be a lasting legacy of kingdom builders who prevail in every sphere of life and help others to do the same. So again, you see the second-generation family vision is built on the first-gen, but uniquely different for them. All right, so with that, let me just say, uh, some of you may be overwhelmed by all this content and all the processes, <laughs> but please know this is not a one-time thing that took us months and months and years actually yes. to develop and refine these things. This is a process. It's not a one-time event. Um, you'll continually refine these statements over time. You'll constantly find ways to reinforce and communicate these guiding principles. Uh, as Shalana has alluded to, we've created traditions around our, our values. Uh, the family's made up songs and chants about our values. We've done plays and skits about our values. <laughs> uh, we've cre created banners like these that you see on the screen in front of our, our family lodge. Um, and uh, again, one of our most recent initiative is uh, creating this uh, family legacy website, which by the way, if you're interested in that, uh, you know, we didn't do this ourselves. I'm not really smart enough and uh, creative enough to do that, but we're using a company called FamilyLegacyTrove.com. I'd highly recommend them if you're interested in doing something like that. All right, so with that, um, let me just transition in the wrap up here to talk about implementation a bit. Uh, our family loves to backpack together. This is the picture at the beginning of one of our, our recent trips in the Cascade Mountains. Um, deciding where we want to go is fun. We kind of all do that together. Uh, our daughter in love, Tay, she kind of leads that. She loves figuring out where to go and presenting it to us, and we all talk about it. But look at what we'd miss if we didn't actually hit the trail. We just planned and didn't actually do something about it, right? <laughs> so it's not enough to know where you want to go. You have to actually take intentional steps to move your family in that direction. So once you've established your family compass, it's important to plan your relational and structural pathways that'll guide your family in the direction of your compass over the years through thick and thin. So I won't take time to talk much about structural pathways uh, today, um, but I'll, I'll mention a few of our relational pathways, but there's, there's structural and relational pathways. Relationships are the carriers of multi-generational success in family, business mm -hmm. and life and everything. So that's why we focus on so much on what we call our relational strategies. And this slide lists our, at least uh, six of our core relational strategies. And I share these only as examples. And again, pointing out a principle. What I did is I figured out <laughs> how I intentionally implement our company's values and strategies in business what are the disciplines that i use in business and said well what could i do that we similar in effect or, or or process in the family but but not feel like business so you see the corollaries in business i have listed uh, to the right here so we do annual family goal setting retreats uh once a year where we get together in january and uh, have a whole process we go through in that maybe one of you wants to share what that looks like uh, we do our mid-year family compass reviews. Uh, Shalai mentioned we, we've typically done that in our backpacking trips. Uh, we take a, a day or so of, of those where we take a, an intentional process to review how we've done against our goals for the year and how we're living out our, our family values um, and celebrate the progress and successes. Uh, we do quarterly family council meetings where a part of each meeting agenda is focused on our family compass and um, these kind of baton passing conversations um, and relational topics. And I'd be happy to send you a list of our family council uh, responsibilities and a sample meeting agenda if you're interested in that. Um, and for many years, we've done weekly family nights. Uh, we've done for many years one-on-one -on -one dates with uh, each of our children where we celebrate and support their goals and ways that they're living on our compass. And these days we do that a bit differently because of being adults with their own families. 
and an int intentional daily connection time, especially for those of us that, that uh, live in the same place. So uh, with that, Shalane, Shelley, do you want to share any specific examples of something that's been meaningful to you about these? Um, sure, I'll talk about the um, family goal setting uh, retreat in January. Leading up to that weekend, which is usually the first or second weekend of January, each person will have taken at least four hours to sit down and get quiet and review the previous year and look forward to the, the coming year and think, now what, what was really effective? And uh, many of us talk to God about that and, and say, what did you really like about what happened in our life last year? Um, and then what would you like to see happen in the coming year? And so we have all that written down. And then when we get together for the retreat, we do some pretty intensive sharing on those dreams and goals and what we've um, heard is going to be uh, happening in our lives this coming year. Yeah, that's great. And again, that's during times of uh, challenge. Um, it it reframes the conversation when we get together, when we have, you know, conversations, Zoom calls or, or in person, um, we're, we already know what each other's goals and dreams are for the year. And we know what's, what's going to have to pivot, you know, as a result of the current circumstances. And we're having a lot of those conversations um, instead of just talking about, you know, the latest thing we saw in the news or um, yes. the latest sports thing, although we still talk about other stuff too, of course, but it's, it's interesting. It keeps us focused. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Shalane? What, what's something you'd like to point out that would be an interesting example? I think you guys covered it really well, actually. Um, the monthly one-on-one -on -one dates were super cool, especially when we were kids, to have one-on-one -on -one time with the parents. You know, dad would take us to Starbucks, which was a big deal as a kid, or you know, mom would take us to ice cream, also a big deal. And then it's really cool now that we're older to do that. Might not be as often, um, but like even as siblings, even though our schedules might not allow for us to do one-on-one -on -one all the time, we, stu we still do get some of that in. Um, but if we want to do it all at once, we'll do a whole family dinner or as siblings, we'll do like a evening out or something. So um at one point we were doing that every quarter i feel like the whole you know organization of things is quite different but um that is the aim and the goal and it's really really special to kind of have those and maintain those like best friend relationships that's awesome just mention what what was the process that we would go through on our one-on-one -on -one dates when you were younger well, it's different for both of you. Mom, we would just chill and talk about different goals. And dad, you know, a lot of times he'd be like, all right, print out your goals. <laughs> and we'd actually like go through them on paper. Um, and as a kid, that was really cool because a lot of times that was the only time, you know, when I was eight or nine, when I would actually look at them and just seeing like, oh, that's really cool. I did accomplish that. I didn't even try to accomplish that. And then I think that ingrained kind of that habit of um, the goal setting and then the celebration. And then also, you know, getting to sit with someone years older than you and see them do the same thing and how that uh, compiles over years was super cool to see as a young kid. And I think gave... I'll just speak for myself, it gave me the ability to think very long term and also honestly be able to have conversation with adults at a very young age because I kind of started to grasp a little bit about how that world worked just because I knew how they thought more. And I was like, I've got goals too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's really cool. Oh, that's great. And, and you inspired us, Shalane. Yeah. All the kids, all the kids inspire us. Yeah, we, especially we often, now. Yeah, You're, we often come back just, together and yeah. go, hey, Yeah, and just to clarify those, like, kids, I remember one of Sky's goals when, because 
for Sky, we started this really young. He had to be probably around six. And one of his yearly goals was don't fight with Shalan as much. Um, I don't have that goal, so I'm not sure if it happened, but <laughs> takes two, so we might have decreased it a little. Um, so as kids, they were really, really simple. I mean, mine was like, feed my horse once a day, so keep an animal alive. Um, you know. <laughs> And then, of course, they grow with relevancy, but. Yeah. <laughs> and for those of you who are parents listening to this thing about doing this, just <laughs> keep in mind that I was not taking ownership of those goals and saying, did you get your goals done? I was just simply saying, hey, what can I celebrate about yeah. what you've accomplished or where you're at? Or can I support you in anything that you're working on? Um, so they really, they're, they develop the goals and we support them in the process. Anyway. The, the the main example that I want wanted to pull from or the illustration from that is that these are these are just processes that we implement to reinforce our values, and you can start doing this wherever you are. We were fortunate to be able to start this process when our kids were fairly young, but we've seen many families start this process when they have, you know, adult kids who are away from home and may just start it themselves and by their example it has a ripple effect to other generations we've seen all kinds of ways to do this and you can start wherever you're at but wherever you start this once you do hit times of challenge or crisis uh, when you have these disciplines built in it's much more effective to go through that time right because you've, you've got some anchoring points and some That's guiding right. factors that are above and beyond circumstances all right, so with that, I'll just wrap up saying you also need to have some structural mechanisms that act as catalysts to activate the sustained success across the generations. And for right now, I'll just put one question out there and just ask you as you, as you define and clarify and start implementing your family compass, think about how will your family mission, vision, and values and any elements of your, your family guiding principles be reflected in your documentation, right? Mm -hmm. Your family documents, your governance documents, your family enterprises, so whether that's your family assembly documents, your family council documents or processes, your family trusts. And we completely redid our whole estate plan and uh, once we realized, oh, we need to actually incorporate this into these documents. Uh, your family businesses, how will these things be incorporated into your philanthropic activities? Uh, your wealth management processes, your bylaws and operating agreements, and any other family structures. So there's, there's plenty of information out there about how to do that and great professionals that can help with that process. So in summary, these are the two stages for developing a family legacy transfer strategy that will serve families well now and in whatever crises, challenges, or opportunities are on the horizon here. First, define your family compass, your values, your mission, and your vision, and then plan and implement specific pathways or strategies, relational pathways and structural pathways to ensure that those are lived out now and for generations to come. So with that, again, I would just recommend that you um, start wherever you at. Pick one element of this that you think you could do something to take your ability to take your family compass out of your pack, the pack of your brain or your heart, mm -hmm. um, and do something to further clarify that, further implement that. Pick one thing that you've learned from this and take the next step to go to the next level, whatever that means for you and your family. Uh, feel free to contact us. You can reach out to me at Lonnie at Wilkinson360impact.com uh, or search for Lonnie Ganger and Systems for Success to find me on social media. We do have a podcast because as we started sharing about this, people asked us lots of questions and I have a couple of really smart next gen here that uh, have their own podcast and they said, Dana, why don't you just do a podcast? And so if people ask a question, you can just refer to them to a podcast uh, episode. And so we've done that and uh, we've got a lot of episodes where all of us in the family or six to eight of us in the family are sitting around riffing on one of these topics or talking about how we uh, did our annual family goal setting retreat right after we just did it. We have episodes uh, where we're talking about specific principles. We have some episodes now where I'm interviewing some super cool families who are six, seven generation families that have been doing this well for years. So look that up on systemsforsuccess.com. 
And I look forward to hearing from you and learning from any of you how you're doing this because at the end of the day, what counts is I'll, I'll ask you the question that Greg asked me 18 years ago. Why don't you lead your family at least as strategically and thoughtfully as you lead your businesses? And take your compass out of your pack <laughs> and use it as a guiding force for your family. Wow. That was an amazing session as of course I have, uh, I knew it would be because Lonnie, Shelley and Shalan and the family really do an amazing job. It was really fantastic and incredibly valuable. I began in my little dialogue, opening it up about the importance of the family dynamics, having a purpose, values, mission, and vision. And Lonnie and Shelley and Shalan did an amazing job of how they incorporate that as a husband and wife and as the next generation in terms of Shalan being the daughter. And I hope this helped to tie the importance of what I mentioned when I kick things off. Again, I know thousands of families. This is the number one thing that's going to cause their destruction or cause their success through multiple generations. And the Gingers and Shelly Watt, Shalane Watt did an amazing job in terms of explaining that. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, iHeart, and other platforms, and founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great success and their single family offices. I could be reached at familyofficeassociation.com and my direct email is angelo at familyofficeassociation.com and I'm very active on social media where you could find me given that this may be a visual uh, opportunity for the audience. Uh, my YouTube channel is a big platform for many of our videos and it's a very simple name given what I do, Family Office. So it's Family Office channel on YouTube. Everyone, thank you so much and have a great day.